so many wonderful musician, musicians today who have led us in our worship service. Thanks to all of you who have illuminated this worship service with your singing and with your instruments. It is truly a blessing to be in this room, and I know that those who were able to experience it at home would say the same thing. So thank you so much, musicians, especially our youth who stepped in today to help lead in our worship. I'd like to invite you to turn to today's focus passage, an Old Testament reading, which is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 17, if you'd like to follow along. When the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to the prophet Nathan, Look, I'm living in a cedar palace, but God's chest is housed in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you're thinking, because the Lord is with you. But that very night, the Lord's word came to Nathan. Go to my servant David and tell him this is what the Lord says. You are not the one to build the temple for me to live in. In fact, I haven't lived in a temple from the day I brought Israel out of Egypt until now. Instead, I have been traveling around in a tent and in a dwelling. Throughout my traveling around with the Israelites, did I ever ask any of Israel's tribal leaders I appointed to shepherd my people, why haven't you built me a cedar temple? So then say this to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heavenly forces says, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock to be leader over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've eliminated all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the name of the greatest person, people on earth. I'm going to provide a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and no longer be disturbed. Cruel people will no longer trouble them as they had been earlier when I appointed leaders over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies." And the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make a dynasty for you. When the time comes for you to die and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your descendant, one of your very own children, to succeed you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a temple for my name, and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. Whenever he does wrong, I will discipline him with a human rod, with blows from human beings. But I will never take my faithful love away from him like I took it away from Saul, whom I set aside in favor of you. Your dynasty and your kingdom will be secured forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported all these words and this entire vision to David. Well, did anyone wake up today and say, it's Reformation Day? No? I'm the only one? Okay. <laughs> it is Reformation Day, by the way. The last Sunday in October is across churches, across the world, probably a little less in Baptist churches, called Reformation Day because on October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg, which kicked off the Protestant Reformation. We celebrated the 500th anniversary about three years ago. So 503 years ago, uh, the Protestant Reformation began. And it all began because Martin Luther disagreed with, on behalf of many, the Roman Catholic Church's sale of indulgences to finance the building of the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. You think you've been a part of a big building project before? You should have seen this one. And the church was selling indulgences in order to pay for that building. In other words, they were asking the poor people of the Roman Catholic Church to give money that would finance the building of the basilica in order that their, those, the loved ones who had gone on before them could be sent into heaven by the purchase of the indulgences. There was a saying that was given to them, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul into heaven springs. And they would get a family certificate that said that their loved one was now with Jesus. We don't sell those here, by the way. 
We've had and will continue to have some creative ways of raising funds in the life of this church, but we will never, ever do that. So Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the church in Wittenberg, and ultimately he asked, you know this if you've studied the Reformation any, Martin Luther wasn't looking to start a new denomination or to start a movement. He was just asking questions, asking questions like, why would you ask poor Christians to give of their little money for the building of this basilica when, when Rome is so wealthy? And more to the point, he insisted that instead we are forgiven because of who God is, not because of money we can give. We are forgiven because of who God is. We are loved and forgiven because God is full of grace and mercy. Really the theological undertone of the entire Protestant Reformation. The spirit of joy Lutheran Church in Woodlands, Texas, writes that Reformation Day matters because on Reformation Day we return to the core of our faith. God loved us first, and God continues to shower us with grace and mercy. The Reformation is one of the most important moments in history. In fact, it played a key role in initiating the period that we call modern history, the past few hundred years. Because of one man's conviction that the church must alone be about God's truth alone, rather than financing a lavish building. Ironic that in today's scripture... One man began all about, lavish, about building a lavish building for God, mostly through the dream of Nathan that we read of today. This will be one of the least known moments in our series. So we've read about the creation, the exodus, the golden calf, the calling of Samuel, Nathan's dream is not something we often regard as a high point of the scripture. It's not something we go to frequently in our study. But there is an important lesson for God's story in this dream and in this challenge to David and to God's people to refocus on the core of God's story. That is being a blessing To the nations. So today is more of a refocus, a rededication in the middle of God's story. And catching up to where we are in the scripture today, we read that the king is settled, David is settled into the monarchy, and he is ready to build a temple for God. The time of the judges has passed, the monarchy is here, the king is on the throne, and to his credit, David wants to build something permanent and lavish for God. What else would you want to give the God of hosts, the God of the universe, rather than the most beautiful palace and earthly home imaginable? But in the prophet Nathan's dream, God says to tell David that he is not, in fact, to build the temple at this moment. In fact, he's not the one to do it at all. God says, I've never asked for this, by the way. I love that side comment that God gives in this passage. Did I ever ask you to build me a palace, God says? God says, let's be about what we're supposed to be about first. Let's be about what we're supposed to be about through your rule, through the Davidic dynasty. God has other plans for now. God has other priorities in this moment. Through his dream and direction to David, God has other plans than the physical building right now. God instead has a primary mission through David to change the course of history. To change the course of history through David's rule and through the strengthening of God's people. God promises that through David's rule, a 
a massive successful dynasty would emerge and a descendant would even be raised up to continue on the work and that this kingdom would be established forever. Now I know where your mind and heart's going because my mind and heart are going there as well. There's something divine, almost otherworldly, about this kingdom. It's, it's not a, a physical kingdom. It's something almost heavenly and spiritual and beyond our wildest imagination, and we'll get there momentarily. But at this point in Israel's history, when David is tempted to think about what can happen in the here and now, God challenges David to pivot from what he thinks God wants to what God actually wants. God will see the promise fulfilled through David. And so God enacts a small reformation in the heart of David in this moment through Nathan's dream. He says, stop being about the financing of this building for the time being. Be about the kingdom. Be about the rule of God in your midst. Jumping ahead in the story to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is addressing divisions in the church at Corinth. Divisions that have risen as a result of following different Christian teachers rather than the work of of the Spirit. And so Paul goes on to say that we are God's co workers and you are God's what? You are God's building. Don't you know that you are God's temple and God's Spirit lives in you? The New Testament story proclaims that Christ followers are the earth, earthly dwelling of God. The work of the kingdom is in and through the work of the body of Christ. That theology is not quite there yet in the Old Testament, but God still sees the work of the kingdom as a priority with David's rule. In the last few months, we've had an outdoor service on the front lawn. I think most of you in this room, or many of you, have experienced that service. We didn't get to have it today because it was still raining. Of course, now it's sunny, but earlier it was raining. And one of the most common pieces of feedback I got was that it was beautiful to sit and to see the front of the church. <laughs> When you're a member of this church, you're mostly just kind of driving in and going to the back and park, and you're going in and you're driving away. So to sit out there for a worship service and to gaze upon this beautiful building made the worship experience different. To see the front of First Baptist Church while we were worshiping as the sun came up for many Sundays of the past few months. Of course, it's not just this physical building that's beautiful. We can drive around the back and see our education building, our banquet hall, our family life center, the youth complex, the preschool, and I'm sure some other buildings I'm forgetting because I, I'm new and I need to learn those things. We have some of the most impressive facilities in the area. I don't think anybody would deny that. And I believe that we are all committed to being good stewards of this space. At least I pray that we are. Let's not even stop at the building itself. We can have the best staff structures, which I think we do. We can also have a great lay leadership structure, build the best children's programs, youth programs, adult programs, sports programs, music programs, missions programs, all in the name of Jesus. And at the end of the day, you know and I know that the structures we put in place are not the end all be all. Whether they are the physical structures that we put in place, and I'm thankful that we have, or whether the organizational structures that we've put in place, and I'm thankful that we have, we must become like David. And be reminded of God not to put all of our eggs in the structure basket. We must not take our eyes off of God's promise to first and foremost be a blessing through his people. Let's acknowledge together, church, even today, that like the house David so desperately wanted to build for God, we too can miss 
what God wants of us and place all of our focus on the big B's, buildings, budgets, and bylaws. We can neglect that which God finds most important, the kingdom, the dynasty, which is forever secure because of Christ's victory. And so two challenges for us today. One, there's still a lot of story left to live. So let's focus on what we can do today and count that God will continue to work in the future. Today's scripture is not even the halfway point of the Bible. It's certainly not the halfway point of our series. God ultimately tells David, there's a lot of story left to play out. And the story that I'm writing is not going to be entirely contained in everything that you do in your limited time on the throne. That is a challenge for us because we want to see everything done right now. But God continues to work even beyond our reach. Strangely, not too far down the road in the scriptures, the story almost seems to crumble. As you move further into the Old Testament, the kingdom becomes divided. The kings are not as strong and faithful as David. Some are complete and other failures. It might seem that the good promise given to David, even in this moment, is shattered down the road. But God promises an eternal, unending reign, even in the most broken of times. And we see that promise given to David fulfilled in Christ, whose victory over sin and death secures the eternal reign of God's kingdom. Like God's people in the scripture, there will be seasons when we think the promise might just be broken. This might be one of those years where we think the promise might be broken. That's when we're challenged to remain faithful and to focus on that which is most important. That God's story has one ending. The new heaven, the new earth, and the king on the throne. Your dynasty and your kingdom will be secured forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. In the meantime, as you live your life, allow God to reform you for the future. Allow God to reform you where needed. And don't we all need it? David was king. David was the faithful king after God's own heart. So I think if David can miss the mark, so can we. So can I. So can you. Where are your blind spots? Where has the mission of God escaped your gaze? I'm thankful for the Protestant Reformation that changed the course of history, that changed the history of the church, ultimately changed Western civilization. But sometimes we just need some reformation in our hearts and minds. I'm all about the big picture, but sometimes we individually just need some reformation in our own hearts. And perhaps it is in years such as this, a year which has seen a global pandemic and global health crisis, a year where extreme polarization and hyper-partisanship has reached a tipping point, a year when economic distress and violence and a host of other challenges has made us wonder if the king is still on his throne. Our answer must be unequivocally, yes, Jesus still reigns and his dynasty has been established forever. Perhaps it is times such as this that we are due for another reformation. Who knows if it finds its way into our descendants' history books like the Protestant Reformation. But what if it becomes just a part of our story? What if we're committed to changing our course at First Baptist Church? What if we're committed to an inter-church reformation where we commit ourselves to focusing on that which is most important? God's people living out the mission of Jesus in our midst like never before. To become a people set apart, focused entirely on the promise that was given to Abraham, 
that found its way to King David and a promise which finds its completion in King Jesus. That love, mercy, grace, and compassion will reign forever and ever. Martin Luther Luther said that from the beginning of my Reformation, I have asked God to send me neither dreams nor visions nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of his word, the Holy Scriptures. For as long as I have God's word, I know that I am walking in his way and that I shall not fall into any error or delusion. And so may it be so with us. Let's pray together. Lord, on this day, we acknowledge as one voice that you are still on your throne and we are your subjects. We pray that we would live under your rule and that we would be about the things that you are about in this world and in our community. There may be times where we wonder if your promise is still alive in our personal lives or in our nation or across the world, but God, you have promised us that your dynasty will reign forever. When we stray, help us to be focused on King Jesus, who guides our steps today, tomorrow, and forever, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.